So as already introduced, I'm going to talk about a usable A-B testing approach today using Bayesian statistics. So welcome to my talk. Um, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Nora. I work as a data engineer at ResearchGate here in Berlin. And before we dig right into it, I'd like to have a show of hands. Who of you has already worked with A-B experiments, split testing? Okay, quite a few. And who of you has already worked with a Bayesian approach to this A-B testing? Bayesian approach? Yes? Nice. Okay, so please correct me if I do something wrong then. <laughs> okay, so first start, why would we actually care about A-B testing at ResearchGate? So um, we want to make absolutely sure that if we introduce changes to our product, and it's quite a diverse uh, product, um, that our members are not negatively affected by it. We also use A-B testing to actually rapidly test new features on our platform and to develop new features iteratively. Um, we regularly run live tests on all different parts of our, of our website to ensure that the scientists really find the right content they actually need. So uh, we test new product designs, we test new product features, um, we look at different conversion rates, for example, or we could also look at product usage metrics. Um, we also test new algorithms, and at any given point in time, we actually run several experiments in parallel on different parts of our platform. Uh, now I've talked a bit about how we use A-B experiments, but there are like a few things to consider first. So I'll walk you through some general considerations which most of you will probably be familiar with. And then um, I'll make some critical points about one of the more common approaches and then we'll look into how we can actually use Bayesian statistics to help us with some of the problems involved with A-B experiment testing. And um, I'll introduce the results of our library, which is still a work in progress, but which will be released soon. Okay, so some general con considerations about A-B experiments. You should really define the motivation behind your experiment, which means you should be impartial when setting up your experiment and not just test to justify a gut feeling. Um, you should think about your user segments, which means um, if you actually optimize parts of your product, how many users and which members could actually benefit from the changes, and is this worth the engineering effort, actually. Um, also, don't test too many versions in parallel, because you actually want to under, uh, identify the underlying pattern, what works best for your members. And when you test um, a lot of versions in parallel, you can actually could dilute um, to see the effective changes that are underlying. And also, don't get frustrated, which means most of your experiments probably won't yield a significant difference between the different variants you're actually testing. Um, you should also know your baseline, which means <coughs> you should actually define key metrics you're working on. So, for example, if you're an online shop and you want people to actually buy stuff on your website and you test, for example, two versions of a new checkout cart, um, you probably won't be interested in the purchases alone, but you would be more interested in average revenue for, per customer, actually, because you want to go with that variant that allows you to earn more money on your website if you're doing that. Um, you should also understand the range of your acceptable fluctuations of your baseline, which means um, your conversion rate is never static, so or rarely static. It might fluctuate with a very um, small margin of error or um, uh, confidence interval, but you should actually look at the different um, time ranges because your conversion rate, rate might change on the time of the day or the day of the week. For example, if you start your experiment on the wrong on a wrong day of the week, and for example, don't let it for long enough, let it run for long enough, you might just um, measure the difference between two days or three days rather than really a user behavior. And not knowing this will actually have problems with uh, hypothesis-based testings. Um, Normally, I'm assuming you're using an experiment framework that actually diverts your traffic to different versions. You can actually um, have, um, you can actually buy solutions or um, buy a monthly fee for them, like a Visual Website Optimizer, or you develop an in-house solution. Um, the split testing, probably most of you are familiar with, so the easiest version is you divert the traffic, 
50% to one, 50% of your users that come to your website see one version, the other 50% see the other version, and then you gather data on them. Um, there are actually more intelligent algorithms. There has been a few years, there has been this nice opinionated blog, an article called 20 lines of code that will beat A-B testing every single time, which introduced the idea of multi-armed bandits to actually um, divert the traffic to your different versions. So that means with multi-armed bandits, you, ha you have a slightly different um, split. Normally, for example, you could say 10% of your users that actually come to your website will be even in, evenly split into 50%, which sees uh, one version or the other. And the rest of, for example, of your traffic to your website, like 90%, will actually see the currently best performing one, which actually helps you to not lose revenue while running the test. What you should also do, and what's very important, is actually to run AA experiments, which is an dummy experiment. Um, that means um, you split your traffic of the users um, to exactly the same version of your website or your landing page, for example. And if you see a significant difference between the two versions, although you show your users exactly the same thing, um, this is an indicator that how you assign users to your experiment has actually, uh, like the system actually has a bug. Most of um, experiment, AP experiment frameworks actually use hypothesis-based testing to um, uh, call a winning variant or to analyze your experiments. Um, we, that's the most widespread technique. Um, we calculate a so-called p-value um, to see if there is a significant difference between two versions. We also measure confidence intervals, but <coughs> To work with those sample, uh, to work with those hypothesis-based approaches, we actually need to set up a fixed sample size in advance, in the most simplest setup. And um, by measuring or calculating the p-value, we actually um, want to control, um, in combination with a significant uh, level, we actually control how often we declare a difference between two variants, although there actually is none. Um, to calculate the sample size uh, in advance, you have to consider your minimal detectable uh, effect. You have to consider statistical power for hypothesis-based testing. This, this means how often will you recognize a successful test, which is typically set to 80%. You also define a significance level, which means how often you will observe a positive result, although there actually is none, which is typically set to a very low number, for example, 5%. There are a lot of sample size calculators out there that allow you to calculate sample sizes in advance. This is an example of Evan Miller's awesome A-B testing tools, uh, where you have a baseline conversion of 3%, for example, and you want to be able to detect if there is um, a 5% relative change to that baseline, which means you actually need to acquire a large sample size for each variant. So depending on how much traffic you now actually get to your website, it could mean that your test is now running, your experiment is now running for several weeks or several months, which in an agile um, development environment sometimes is not feasible. Con um, the smaller your minimum uh, detectable effect uh, is, the more samples you will need to collect per variant. The larger actually the true difference between your two, sam uh, two versions of your website is, the less samples you will actually need to confirm that there is a difference between the two versions. Um, in an ideal world, you would probably stick to the rules. The experiment will run exactly as long as you need to, um, according to your pre-calculated sample size. Your website has enough traffic, so you don't have to wait weeks over weeks to actually gain results um, and define a winning variant of your website. Um, you don't look at your experiment while it is running. That's very important. And you only test two versions against each other and not more than that. And you're really, really patient and nobody actually bothers you to tell you a preliminary result before while the experiment is already running. Um, and if you run exactly like this, you won't have any problems with hypothesis-based testing. However, in the real world, with significance-based experiment evaluation, 
um, we calculate the p-value with our preferred statistical test. And this is actually the probability of your data given your hypothesis. So it's not the probability um, of your hypothesis given the data, because that's not what the p-value tells you. If you use a hypothesis-based testing um, approach to declare one winning variant, um, you can only reject the null hypothesis, and your null hypothesis will be there is actually no difference between the two versions, although you're actually testing for the exact same opposite of this situation. And there is no indication if your result is important. So there is no highly significant result when you just calculate the p-value. Um, statisticians have been teaching people to calculate confidence intervals to capture the uncertainty of your measurement. However, there are some uh, problems with those confidence intervals, actually, because a confidence interval, which you, for example, calculate with 90, you calculate the 95% confidence interval, that actually means it will contain the true parameter with 95% probability, but this is not the same as a 95% probability that the true parameter falls within your interval. What that means is actually you could compare it with, you say, um, the Pope is Catholic, but not every Catholic is the Pope. So that's um, the confidence intervals, depending on how many experiments you run, they actually fluctuate. So they will contain the true parameter, yes, but you have no guarantee that the true parameter, which means your conversion rate, for example, is exactly in the center of your confidence interval. And the more experiments you actually run, the more it will actually fluctuate. And if you peek at your, uh, and look at your running experiments and actually test before it's done, it actually means that you increase the chance of falsely detecting a statistical significant difference between your two versions because you actually run into the multiple hypothesis testing problem. This um, not only means that you won't that you might falsely detect a statistical significant result, but it could also mean that you fail to detect a statistical significant result. And this effectively corrupts your test. Um, the formula on the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see it, actually helps you to calculate how you increase the probability of detecting a falsely positive significant result which means n is the number of, um, for example, variants you test, n is the number of segments you choose for an experiment to analyze it after the fact, because that's something um, a lot of people do. For example, we have uh, an, uh, had an experiment running. There is no significant difference between two versions, but then you think, let's look at the countries, for example, where the users came from to analyze if there is a significant difference between users coming from a country, looking at the different versions you actually have shown them throughout the experiment. If you don't correct for this, and there are, there are ways around this, so you can either use um, sequential testing, where you actually introduce a very strict p-value correction. That means um, you decide beforehand how many tests you're actually going to run. And that means, um, depending on how many versions you're actually going to um, compare, you have to reduce your p-value. So you can't just say, if the p-value is below 0, 0, 0.05, I have a significant result, but rather you have to decrease this value. So it's very, very low in the end, which is a normal, um, that's called a Shidak correction, and um, this is a very restricting. And you could also use a false discovery rate, which means um, you um, control based on the significant results you get with multiple tests, you control the ratio of the false positive um, results in this set. So it's a bit stricter and you can control the error rate a bit better. And given all these problems with um, hypothesis-based testing, um, we actually wanted to find some ways around this at ResearchGate. So we thought, um, uh, we searched for a method that actually um, helps us to easily communicate results we get from such an eBay experiment uh, setup. And our primary goal, after all, is um, 
even if we don't have any significant better version or whatever, we want to make absolutely sure that at least the version we choose after running an experiment is not worse than the one before. Okay. Um, and interestingly, also last year, um, Visual Website Optimizer actually introduced their Smart Stats engine, which also uses Bayesian statistics to call a winning variant. And um, I've written two statements here, um, uh, which we think, uh, for example, are quite relevant in this discussion, because with the first hypothesis-based testings, you could only say, we reject the null hypothesis that the variant A is equal to the variant B with a p-value of 002, which would be a significant result. But isn't it better to actually communicate that there is an 85% probability or chance that the variant B has a lift, that it has an 8% lift over variant A? So that's why we started to look into Bayesian statistics and Bayesian reasoning. And Bayesian reasoning um, can be um, nicely explained with this nice quote from Sherlock Holmes uh, to Watson. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated, eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, it must be the truth. So um, with Bayesian reasoning, we actually update our beliefs about our data when we gather evidence. So that means, uh, for example, we think we have um, a conversion rate that is, uh, for example, zero, uh, for example, four percent, and the more evidence, the more data we gather throughout our experiment, the more we can either confirm or deny this um, prior conviction. And um, I'm quickly going through some of the um, formulas involved with uh, Bayesian statistics. So we first of all have the Bayes theorem, which um, gives you the posterior probability of your hypothesis given the evidence. So this is what we've learned after we've gathered enough evidence, um, which is the likelihood of your evidence if your hypothesis is true, times the prior probability of your hypothesis. And then you also have the prior probability that the evidence is true, but you can. this is a normalizing um, term which you wouldn't really need in the setting of an A-B split testing. So um, the easier version is that the posterior probability, after we've gathered enough evidence, is the prior probability that my hypothesis is true times the likelihood, which means the evidence, uh, likelihood of my evidence, which the likelihood of my data, if my hypothesis is true. And an interesting thing about A-B testing, especially the split testing approach, is that we actually have non-overlapping populations. Because if you use an A-B experiment framework, one user that comes to your website will only be shown one single version of your experiment. One user should not be part of both experiment versions. And if you assume that this is true, A and P, for example, our two versions, actually become independent, which means the posterior probability for two conversion rates, given your data, actually becomes a multiplication of uh, the posterior probability for each single version. Um, and luckily, also a conversion rate in terms of views and clicks is like a coin flip model. So with, a coin, with coin flip model, I mean you can throw a coin and it can either come up with heads or tails. Um, when you have, uh, if you show your website um, to a certain amount of users, they can either click or follow something or they don't. So you have a success or a failure event. And this is very handy because um, if we want to compare the two variants, the po their posterior probabilities, their posterior, their posterior probability becomes a two-dimensional function of both conversion rates. We, however, still can calculate likelihood, which is a binomial event, and the prior probability, which actually follows a beta distribution. And because we have a binomial likelihood function, our conjugate posterior distribution also becomes a beta uh, distribution. And conjugate uh, distributions in Bayesian statistics only mean that the prior and the posterior probability distribution are of the same family. So in this case, they are both a beta distribution. 
Um, this is the formula for the posterior distribution now for our variant A. And uh, as I said before, the conjugate posterior probability becomes a beta distribution again. And we can easily write this as the beta distribution of our conversion rates for variant A with two separate parameters, A and B, which are actually um, necessary to form a beta distribution. And this is um, choosing these parameters A and B uh, in an AB experiment setting is kind of a black art. You can either choose an uninformative priors, which means you don't have any strong conviction about, for example, if you test a new feature and you implement two variants, of it and show it to the users, you are highly likely that you don't know your base conversion rate beforehand. So you don't have any strong convictions about how the data might be distributed. So you can simply choose, for example, a so-called uninformative uniform prior, which would be the red line. This means that um, your parameters for the beta distribution A and B actually are set to one, which is exactly this uniform distribution. Um, I've also plotted uh, the blue line is, for example, uh, where you have, where you set, when you always set A and B to the same value, you can choose, but all of them are essentially uninformative priors because the mode, which means the um, value of your distribution with the highest probability, will always be 0, 0,5, meaning 50%. However, you can also, if you have, for example, the case where you've run several experiments and several, and you um, actually watch your conversion rate of a different part of your website regularly, and you're really, really sure that, for example, in this case, um, your conversion rate is most probable around 4% uh, in this case, you can actually also calculate the parameters A and B which would be your prior parameters from this distribution, given that you have uh, the um, kind of standard deviation of your distribution and um, this given also the sample size you've actually already acquired. So this is the prior uh, distribution. And now let's talk about an example experiment and how we can actually use it neatly to analyze uh, our AB uh, experiment results. So we have two variants, for example. We let the experiment run for exactly one week because we actually want to capture the whole traffic. So we want to capture a normal week on our website, for example, which is very important because, again, if you only adhere to sample sizes depending on your traffic, either you have to collect much more data or you actually have so much traffic that it could be done with your experiment within a few minutes. For example, if you probably Google, you probably have 200,000 views within a few seconds or minutes. So the experiment would only run for a total duration of uh, two minutes, for example. So in this case, we've uh, had two versions of, uh, let's say, a sign-up page maybe. And um, we have a different number of clicks. And we've acquired a total number of views throughout our, our experiment. And then we want to find the posterior probability that the conversion rate of variant B is actually greater than the one of variant A. And um, we don't have to calculate everything by hand. We can also do Monte Carlo style sampling, which means we actually approximate the posterior probability distribution and we draw samples from our posterior beta distribution to obtain credible values for our conversion rates for both variants. And um, to make this easier, we can e actually use NumPy, but there are also very good, there's also a very good package called PyMC, where you actually have a more advanced um, sampling procedure. And you op will obtain a distribution of credible conversion rates using this approach, and um, you can then also calculate the so-called highest density interval, which in this case, actually, for example, if you say with a credible interval of 95%, then you can actually say with a 95% probability, your true value will fall within this range, which you can't do for normal confidence intervals. Um, this is just a quick, simple um, uh, approach you could use. So you use um, uh, 
uh, you import from NumPy random, you import the beta distribution, you sample, for example, in our case, we sample one million times. And then uh, we've used here an uninformative prior, which where we set A and B to one, which is the uniform distribution, because we have no strong conviction whatsoever what the conversion rates of our variants could be. And then, uh, as I said before, we wanted to have something where you can easily interpret the results, results afterwards. So we just simply plot the distribution of our conversion rates. And we found out that this is very easy to communicate to other people within our company, because they will totally get there is a huge gap between those two versions and there will no, won't be a discussion, is this significant, because we don't calculate that in, with using Bayesian statistics, and there won't be a discussion, do the confidence in, uh, intervals, for example, overlap? Because you can clearly see, for example, in this case, no, they don't. And in this case, uh, this is for the data I showed you before, for the clicks and views, we actually, the variant A has um, the high, highest um the mode of uh, our variant A distribution is actually at 53.9%. Uh, the mode for variant B is at 59%. And what's really uh, nice is because we have distributions of our conversion rates, we can also calculate the difference between our two versions and again obtain a distribution of the relative difference between the two variants, which is also, also clearly nice because then if we calculate the 95% highest density interval, we can say that at least if we now change from uh, variant A to variant B, we at least get 6.4% relative increase, which we can't really um, do if we use hypothesis-based testing. And we can also say there is an 85% probability that the variant B has a lift of over 8% over variant A. And it has a 100% probability that it's actually six, at least 6.4% increase. Um, we can also use this method to actually work with multiple variants. And there we are not really interested in, uh, in every single difference uh, compared to the, um, our, ver for example, version A, which could be our default variant. But we are rather interested in calculating an overall probability of choosing one variant being the best. And in this case, we can easily identify variant E as being the one version uh, with the highest probability. And uh, we then again can calculate the lift and see that we uh, at least get an increase of 15%. And you can also use this approach for sequential data collection, which you can't really do with a hypothesis-based approach. Because as the Bayes reasoning is, we collect more data, and based on that, we update our beliefs and update what we actually believe about our conversion rates. Uh, we can calculate and uh, we can actually set a threshold of not caring, which means if my two variants, um, if there is a difference between my two variants and it's um, like um, zero, zero, one percent, I wouldn't really care if I ch change to the actually worst performing variant because I don't care about a loss in conversion rate of 001%. And we can calculate the expected performance loss um, by choosing one variant over the other. And this is actually can be used as a stopping criterion. Um, to choose to actually decide which version to choose, you can also use uh, the region of practical equivalence, which is again a concept, um, but that's based on the difference between two variants. So this is a in interval around the null value, because if you, your two variants are exactly the same, they will have their center of their difference delta distribution exactly at null, zero. And then you can uh, define a small um, interval, for example, where you also say, um, I don't care if uh, uh, my highest density, um, if there is this difference that falls within that region. And I can compare the rope and the highest density interval um, of the relative lift, and then I can uh, actually decide which variant to use. And uh, as we gather more data, what actually happens if you calculate uh, um, these probability distributions, the more data you acquire, the narrower your, your um, distributions get. And after a certain point, for example, I set my threshold of caring, meaning I don't care if 
my new variant B or my new version actually performs 0.01% worse than my default variant that I have right now. And you just add views and clicks on a regular basis. You can do this every day, you can do this every 15 minutes, that's your choosing. And you can stop with that as soon as you have acquired enough samples, which also means you don't have to calculate your, expected, your sample size in advance, because it really depends on the traffic. And you can also calculate the um, difference. And again, uh, if you let it run for uh, several days, you will see that the difference, the delta between our two versions that I've shown you in the previous plot, um, gets smaller and smaller. And we can see, because all the, the both dif distributions from the last um, slide actually completely overlap, so there might not be a significant improve improvement when I choose my variant version. However, as we follow a Bayesian reasoning, we would actually say, okay, I won't lose a lot if I change to the new variant and I might learn something more, which is actually relevant in a business decision setting. So with that, thank you for your <laughs> attention. <laughs> Okay, th thanks a lot, Nora. I think that was really interesting, and you see the packed room, so everyone is interested in A-B testing. I'm quite sure we have questions. Yes, there's the first one. He Hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, what do you do when you have metrics that are not binary, but uh, are, yep. so then you probably have some, yeah, how, how do you choose your priors there when you do this um, um, normal distribution? Yeah, so um, if you don't have any uh, conversion rates and no binary outcome, your likelihood function is not binomial anymore. So you can still, for example, choose a prior normal distribution, which that mean you don't have to specify A and B for your prior beta distribution and you won't have a conjugate prior, uh, conjugate prior and posterior probability distribution anymore. So this is really a setting that works well for conversion rates. However, um, if you really want to have more information on that detailed, um, I'll recommend you John Kruschke's Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-testing because there you actually um, work with differences in means of two samples. So not a conversion rate, not a binomial outcome, but rather you have other underlying distributions. Does that answer? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Here's another question. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you have uh, code examples of what you showed uh, online or? Uh, not yet, we will release that pretty soon because this will be a library you can actually use and uh, where oh, you nice. can, yeah. There was one in the back, I think. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you didn't really talk much about the prior and I think a lot of the power of Bayesian reasoning comes from the prior. Can you maybe say a little bit about how to select uh, good prior and like um, you mm -hmm. used uninformative priors but like they limit your scope of, of your Bayesian analysis and are sometimes random like you're essentially assuming the same distribution between your A and your B which not necessarily might be the, the way to go. Um, well the distribution should I mean theoretically be the same and we I mean if we want to test um, two versions against each other it would be quite um, unfair to actually assume different priors for each distribution unless we've tested them already before if you had already run an experiment of two variants and then you want to actually improve one version then you could use a prior beta distribution and could sample actually get the a and b parameters from that um, I would argue. <laughs> but um, as I said uh, before, I mean, there is one slide uh, where you actually exactly know that your variant will be, for example, will have a conversion rate of 4%. So you know where the mode of your uh, distribution is. And there are two simple formulas based on the data, you, data you've already acquired, which means like the total number of views, for example, and your mode, you can actually calculate A and B from that. However, 
if you choose a very informative prior distribution, this also means you have to gather more evidence in order to actually be sure uh, that the posterior distribution... So if you want to um, actually compare two variants and then you have to gather much more data in terms of actually to actually change the posterior distribution. Because if you use an uninformative prior, this actually means that the posterior probability distribution is mainly driven by the data you have acquired. Yeah, but if you use an inf uh, informative prior, you have to gather much more evidence, meaning you have to, uh, the likelihood does not influence your, your posterior probability distribution as much. So you mean when you actually have... Yeah, but then you already know that, for example, then you can use, uh, yeah, okay, so if you have like uh, already your default variant implemented and then you want to uh, compare a new variant against each other, then it's actually good because, yeah, okay, yeah, in that setting, if a repetitive set testing, sorry, <laughs> that was uh, my misunderstanding, then it would actually make more sense to use um, your prior information about your default variant, for example, because then you should actually gather more evidence that your a uh, new version might be better or not, yeah. Hi, uh, very interesting. Um, you said that Visual Website Optimizer implemented already this approach, yeah. or sort of. Yeah. Uh, so my question would, would be, what's the difference between their implementation and what you're going to release? Um, I, c I can't really tell you what they exactly implemented, to be honest. <laughs> um, I know that they also use a, um, a stopping rule. Uh, for your experiment, that's also based on the expected performance, uh, or uh, um, based on expected performance loss, and um, you probably have to follow Chris Duccio's blog because he actually, I think, was responsible for implementing that at Visual Website Optimizer to see what they actually implement. I'm, I haven't read the technical paper yet. So I, can't, I mean, the idea is actually the same, but we do have a different experiment framework and um, an in-house framework, so we can't, we won't choose someone else over ours. <laughs> Great, so do we have more questions? If not, then I would say let's thank Nora again. <laughs>